Hello, hello everyone. I'm glad to return to the Koine debates and discussions. And today we have a conversation with a particular speaker, uh, with Leon Conrad, whom I know very, know very well as a, as a thinker who dedicates his time and his efforts to understand the role of tradition tradition as itself and tradition in contemporary society. And of course, he's uh, also well known as a traditional tutor. And you can actually see this line uh, in the, uh, on, our, uh, on, on our frame. So uh, I, would start, I would start with one question to you, Leon, which is, how do you think, what is tradition? What are we actually meaning when we use this word? Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about a subject which is dear to my heart. And to answer the question, I would like to distinguish between tradition and a tradition. Oh, okay. What I'm interested in is tradition. If we talk about a tradition, just to clarify what I mean, there can be a tradition of dictatorship. There can be a tradition of wrongdoing. Tradition, for me, links more to something which has a moral core, it is linked to perennial philosophy and has a timeless quality to it. The core of the word has to do with passing down, handing down. But it's more of a channeling, a channeling of something through uh, someone to someone else. And the best description I've had of tradition comes from an architect I know who works with geometry a lot in the design of his buildings, John Allen. He describes tradition as a tree, a tree which grows perpetually. Its roots are deep in the ground and it, it gets its nourishment from the culture, the uh, time, the space it's in, and the tradition bearers are the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the fruits, which grow, develop, fall, and seed and nourish the ground, which continues to give life to the tree. But actually, tree and ground are one and the same. Okay, um, thank you for this definition. Then I would try to put a finger in several wounds that it has. First of all, uh, you spoke about this timelessness of tradition or spe special temporality. Uh, as a modernist, uh, I perceive the meaning of the word tradition, of the term, uh, as something that rather dates back. So it's more, uh, more connected with the roots rather than the, the leaves or the fruits. What's wrong in my perception? How can there be tradition without innovation? Mm -hmm. And yet any tradition worth its salt will encourage innovation within the bounds of its tradition. Innovation for the sake of innovation is meaningless. Okay, well, when I'm looking, uh, you, you already started this differentiating between tradition and a tradition or the traditions in plurality, because we have a lot of around them. So what I see today is certain tension between, between uh, these traditions and contemporary time, the present time. 
Well, let me explain. I, I'm, I'm looking at uh, our societies in Eastern Europe or here in Italy, and I see how the past is being reused today, so sort of innovation or reinterpretation uh, of the past, uh, when some traditional phenomena uh, receive very new and quite dangerous for human dignity, for human and also communal uh, perception. For example, there's uh, uh, famous embroidered shorts of the peasants of the 19th century that were used in certain moments of life by peasants, which had this specific meaning, wedding or death of a relative or something very important suddenly be becomes the uniform of ethnically minded uh, activists. Well, it happens in Russia, it happens in Serbia, it happens in Ukraine. And uh, I, I can find examples in Germany, uh, in I have dead that, that try to abuse the past or in Italy with this uh, tradition of the Roman empire being reused by contemporary uh, politicians. So is it really, the danger of a tradition or it's the danger that is part of the of tradition itself without any article anything can be abused uh, the are you within the tradition innovating or are you outside the tradition tradition appropriating mm -hmm. The examples you gave are familiar, I could give you other ones. You, we could speak for ages about traditions that have been misunderstood, um, appropriated, misappropriated. I want to give you the example that comes from Japan of a living tradition bearer who is responsible for keeping up the tradition of maintaining and rebuilding a Shinto temple. Right. He will come from a family of tradition bearers. From a very early age, he will have been taught the knowledge, the craft of working with wood, but not just working with wood, working with living wood, the trees that are used to supply the wood for a temple. He would have been taken to walks through the forest on the mountain. He would have been shown the difference between the trees that grow on the south side of the mountain and the way the sun helps those trees grow and what makes the wood different there to the trees which grow on the north side of the mountain. And why using trees from the south side of the mountain is important when you are selecting wood that will be used for the south side of the temple. He will understand what the wood is doing in its living state when the time comes to cut down the wood of the tree, he is taught the ritual that is conducted at that time. It is an address to the tree that says, I will respect the life in your wood, in you. And the tree is cut down, the wood is prepared, respected, used, and employed in the building and the building will have life because the life is brought in through the wood through the use of space through the use of proportion geometry and understanding of a whole how the thing connects to the whole and that i'd say is a hallmark of tradition by contrast to the examples you cited these are signs or symbols used for a certain purpose, but they don't really connect to a bigger whole. 
And tradition, for me, connects the individual with the universal. Okay. Well, but by using the metaphor of the wood, of trees, of these plants, of course, you, you, you have a good instrument to uh, debacle any attempts uh, of, uh, of a modernist to criticize you. But let's return to this usual uh, formula that is, uh, divides all the human time, the time of humanity into two big parts, huge part, probably a million of years of uh, archaic and hundreds of years of modernity. And of course, we, we don't know these archaic times. We, we know bits of them. So we know that there were several humanities in the past. And our ancestry the, the, is the one that won the competition of different human kinds, different human breeds. Uh, and then uh, when the, the, the cesura between archaic and modernity starts, it starts with uh, from the, the western part of, or northwestern part of Europe. There's a, there's a, some mistake, which usually in every generation in traditional society, there are uh, chaotic events that could ruin a traditional society and traditional way of life. But somehow every, tra every tradition Every tribe, every king has its own methods of like recovery, treatment of this uh, wound, which is also a very important part of the life cycle in each uh, uh, traditional society, in archaic society. But something happens in Southern England and the city where you live in London, in Paris, in Amsterdam and Antwerp. And then this, mistake this problem well we, we should add probably madrid here as well because this mistake with columbus from columbus to luther to to erasmus to shakespeare to 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 newton well this mistakes only grows and this mistake uh, cannot be uh, treated by traditional society and the modern society grows from rather small community of intellectuals into big uh, social movements and then the change in culture. So this change which uh, differs creates the cesura uh, between archaic and modern society. And then when you use this metaphor of the plant of the tree, for example, it has a very good uh, way of joining the two. So usually sociology or philosophy uses these terms as if this differentiation is absolute. The way you describe is, uh, is uh, a healing way in a way. So it brings back the solidarity of us modern with us pre-modern. But at the same time, it, it brings something scary that leaves not in human being, but in human kin, in a tribe, in this supreme primordial. Are you not afraid of bringing this archaic past through tradition, uh, through tradition and through the traditions into our present, which is problematic in many other ways? No, because I don't see the past as okay. You are, I think, creating a past is bad, modern is good, modern is bad, past is good, false dichotomy. There is good and bad in the past, there's good and bad in the present, there will be good and bad in the future. The question is, how do we find balance? Mm -hmm. And I think tradition helps Show us how. Okay, then uh, I, I let, let me give you an example. 
Uh, one of the questions that interests me a lot is why is an inch as long as it is? And anyone who knows about the difficulties of converting from inches to meters, centimeters, etc., will appreciate that it would be more convenient to have a universal or universally agreed system. Right. And there have been arguments whether that should be imperial, whether that should be metric. What few people understand, and this is something I've had to learn about, um, and it's taken a lot of time, trouble, research, is that there was a system of measure that, yes, did provide different feet and different lengths of inch across the world, but this, this system was completely unified and all the variations fitted together in a proportional way, which was completely in harmony with the dimensions of the earth. And the variance of the foot related to the variance of the measure, the subdivision of the surface of the ideal globe uh, at various degrees of latitude. Why or how this understanding came to be, where the system came from, no one knows. It's open to conjecture, but the system is mathematically sound. When you understand this, you understand that there is a common thread to what appears on the surface to be disparate, mm -hmm. random chaos. The need to appreciating difference and diversity is to understand how that relates to the commonality behind it. Rather than to try to impose a system of conformity and regularity onto something which is much more interesting, much more varied and much more life enhancing. Well, I'm, uh, I'm listening to you and then uh, I recall also this, the specificity of temporality that we live in, this present time that Hans Ulrich Gumbricht calls the big present time. It's so big that it fragments in many different uh, zones, pieces that start referring to the past like reinventing the past, uh, which also in many ways um, destroys even th those remainings of tradition that we have today. And um, it creates e even less uh, understandable world, universe that we live in. But in, from the point of view of people, of humans living in this fragmented big present, the future is also seen as something that is closed. Uh, it's either source of fear with all this zombie apocalypse and uh, only the bad uh, predictions. So it's not only the past which is dangerous, but also the future that is dangerous. It's, it, it really is different from this classical modernist point of view like 50 years ago when everyone expected big progress. Well, it can be liberal progress, it can be communist progress, but there's these huge expectations from progress. Now, the, the price of progress is clear. We live in postmodern or hypermodern or whichever you call the, the age. And then this fear of the future is probably very symptomatic. So the, not, it's not the past only, but also the, the any other time rather than present is seen as the source of the fear. Can today's thinking and can today's proper use of tradition cure these fears? It's 
fear and desire are the great drivers, aren't they? So they are always experienced in the present. Perhaps what tradition can offer is an understanding of continuity, an understanding of where we are in relation to our past, where we are in relation to tradition, and that puts things into perspective. We no longer then, arguably, come up with ideas uh, great ideas like communism or liberalism or um, ideologies that seek to impose some kind of ideal structure on a structure that is not ideal, but rather we acknowledge what works, what doesn't work, work within tradition to maintain balance and hand over. That's the etymology of the word tradition, to transmit, to hand over what we have received to future generations. Ideally in a better state than we received it ourselves. Well, you and I are fathers. Right, we uh, in the role as the, as fathers, we have the role of making better, very concrete future of of our kids. Do you think we are fulfilling these roles well today? It's not only about you and me, but about our generation of parents. Are we? making this parenthood uh, proper? Do we prepare our kids to accept the past and the future in non-traumatic way? It's a deep question to the extent that we have responsibility and control over that which we are responsible for and can control. It's up to every individual to look within themselves and say, could I have done better? And then it becomes a dialogue. And I'm lucky enough to have uh, a positive relationship with my daughter that we can have conversations like that. What could we do better? How can I help you? Um, what in general, and this is very generalized. I think people have changed in their approach to parenting. No longer is corporal punishment seemed acceptable. Uh, there is less control over children's destinies or desires to be who or what they are. There is less pressure to follow in family businesses or family traditions. And I think that is positive. If individuals are allowed to shine, to find their own vocation and realize it, and parents facilitate that, then there is a focus on life as tradition rather than a family tradition, a national tradition, a cultural tradition. While those are important, life is tradition. And the more you respect that, the better parents I think will be. Okay, that was about parenthood, but as tutor and as the traditional tutor, uh, how do you see this role? What's the mission of a tutor and tutorship is in contemporary world? Oh, I model myself on the Oxford tutorial system, which is about having a conversation. I am inspired by the liberal arts tradition which 
is a tradition that goes back literally thousands of years. One of the most important things I teach is Aristotle's 10 categories of being. Mm -hmm. Every student I've had has gone through the 10 categories with me. They are a fantastic tool and any tool that has been talked about and used for literally over 2000 years has to be worth knowing about. Why they don't teach it in schools, I do not know. But that is one of my starting points. That and knowing how language works, knowing the parts of speech, being able to analyze a sentence and being able to spot the subject of a sentence. If you can't spot the subject of the sentence, you literally do not know what the author is writing about. Uh, being able to think clearly, being able to think for yourself, being able to argue, learning that logic is a tool to check your correct thinking, but that it rests or falls on a knowledge of truth. And that knowledge is not rational. Being grounded in universal values, truth, goodness, harmony, coming together to support the ones of being. That to me is what traditional tutoring is all about. Amazing. That's, uh, that's the spirit of, of another tradition, a, a tradition of tutorship. Uh, but when I listen to you and I recall the several attempts by Aristotle of, in those texts that we attribute to Aristotle, what category is, it's usually connected with this ability to tell something, what can be said actually. Uh, about, and this, what is said is reflects or corresponds to the state of affairs in reality. So this correspondence is, is very important, but also the, the way we put together the elements of what is being told. And that's this order, it's narration. And I remember several of your lectures that I listened to, they were connected with the structure of narration. Why and how do you put together tradition as such and category and narration? What well, is let's go back to Aris let's go back to Aristotle. Um, I think it's in the metaphysics where he defines the substance of well, he talks about the substance of a living person and saying it would be stupid to talk of a living person, uh, sorry, to talk of a corpse as a person, because what makes the difference is what makes the difference between a living person and a corpse. And that uh, he described in terms of substance. So substance for Aristotle was not so much what can be said about something, but what is intuited of something. Intuitive, okay. Uh, he was wanting to, yes, describe something comprehensively, but so that he could understand its essence. Substance is essence, usia. Right. Uh, you then go into telling the story, describing it, putting it into words. What, how do you order your description? Your description will occur through time. It'll have a beginning, it'll have a middle, and it'll have an end. But the contemplation of whatever it is you're describing will be instantaneous. It's a different way of acting or being within time and space. There is a long tradition of what could be called fourfold vision. I believe Aristotle thought this way, uh, his four metaphysical causes can be mapped onto this. You have later uh, thinkers like Dante talking about the fourfold vision, which maps onto the medieval exegesis, the literal, the metaphorical, the analogical, the anagogical, 
ways of reading the text. You, know, you see it in Goethe, who, so, who looked at, in this case, a plant, I think, on his book on plants, saying there were four approaches to studying a plant. You looked at it logically, observed it, ideally over a year, and looked at how it behaved and changed over the seasons. You um, looked at its uh, functionality and how it related to other things, and it maps onto the things. But the fourth uh, thing was you become one with the plant. And again, this is about getting to the essence. In William Blake's work in the late 18th, early 19th century, he has a fourfold vision of the world where his language is often a barrier, but he talks about four states of being, oral, which is a very materialistic state in which you see a tree simply as a source of fuel or wood. You cut it down whenever you want, make whatever you want with it, no thought to the future. The next state is generation, where you see the tree as a source of fuel or firewood or wood to make furniture, but you also respect that if you cut it down and don't plant another tree, you're not going to be able to build on that resource. It's not going to be sustainable. So you look after it. The third state he talks about is uh, Beulah, where there is much more of a lovely, dovey, sensual experience of the tree. This is where you would go out and hug the tree. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is a more spiritual state. It's what he calls Eden Eternity. In Eden Eternity, we are one with the tree. The tree is human. There is life everywhere. And Eden Eternity contains all the other states. They are just unified in this fourfold vision. That, for me, is what story is. Where does story come from? Why do we story? It's a question I've been thinking about for a long time. And the answer I've come up with, rightly or wrongly, is that story is an embodied way of making sense of what we experience. And we order events that happen to us. And stories arise generally, not always, but generally, from an initial problem. But problems come in different kinds. And every kind of problem results in a different kind of story. To give you two simple examples, a problem we can solve ourselves results in a quest structure. It's the story of the three little pigs, where characters have a problem, they go on a journey, they typically meet friends or helpers, the gifts or qualities those friends or helpers have enable them to overcome, eventually, the enemy or hindrance. And that leads ultimately to a resolution. That's a very simple arc. Very often there are complications. That's try, try again structure. And you can have a tragic ending or a positive outcome or resolution. If there is a problem which a person cannot solve easily, by themselves, then a story structure unfolds, such as the rags to riches structure, where you have the intervention by a fairy godmother, a supernatural being, and a savior character. And it's the savior character going on a quest in order to solve a problem for themselves that helps the protagonist in the larger rags to rich uh, structure, Cinderella, for instance, to get to where they need to go. 
without the fairy godmother coming in, Cinderella would not be able to go to the ball. Without her going to the ball and coming away, the prince would not have found his true love. And because he's lost his true love, he has to go on a quest to find her. And when he does, both characters attain the happy ending. What does this mean? Well, if we look at story as an embodied way of making sense of our experiences, and we accept that there is such a thing as story logic or laws of story, and the stories we tell, such as Three Little Pigs or Cinderella, are simply an embellishment of what is an underlying universal structure. And if we look at the underlying universal structure, we don't have to limit ourselves to thinking about fairy godmothers or angels or uh, supernatural beings. We can, and I think quite rightly, look at the intellect, inspiration, intuition as being the metaphysical supernatural equivalence of the fairy godmothers. And we have those in, in us. When we face problems we cannot solve easily ourselves through our rational modes of thinking, that's when we can turn to intuition, to um, instinct, to tradition to find a way out. So story for me is central. Right. And tradition then is one of those transcendental sources of strength for humans to live in the difficult present times. But not in an airy fairy Bueller sense to use Blake's term, but oh, this is tradition, it must be beautiful. Look at this beautiful embroidered shirt. If I wear it, I will be um, almost donning a cloak of visibility and imbuing myself with the qualities of tradition. No, you've got to immerse yourself in it and really understand it for yourself. So that it, beca so that it comes alive within you and then you become the bearer i see well i think the now we kind of got a glimpse on your thinking your metaphysics and also uh for the discussions that we do in kanye community on tradition traditionalism modernity and postmodernity can be enriched with what you said. Thank you very much for this conversation. And I think we will continue from time to time to come back to the issues of common interest. Thank you very much, Leo. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.